I'm aware that, that sometimes uh, people come into our world and uh, stay in our world and they like it, but they don't have a clue what's going on. Um, and, and some people have been waiting a long time uh, and still don't know. Are you, are you, I don't need a show of hands. I'm just saying it can happen in, in the sort of process that, that we're in. I, I just want to, if, if you feel like that and have felt like that for a while, I just want to really a- applaud you that you're still here. <laughs> really, really well done. Um, and and I, I kind of ended the last time I talked with a, a couple of uh, sections from the Bible. And I, I want to go there right now. So John chapter 6, we've talked about a lot. And I think the reason we talk about it a lot, because it, it's, it's really appropriate. So in John chapter 6, Jesus does his famous uh, seeker-sensitive sermon uh, on eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Do you remember that bit? And uh, he's, he's standing there, and there's crowds and crowds, thousands of people, and he stands up and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you can have no part in me. And this, and this, this grand proclamation and declaration uh, to move everyone towards cannibalism is meted with, with shock, derision, and church decrease. Except for the disciples, and he turns to them and and, and, and says, what, well, what's going on with you? Why aren't you doing the same? And he says, well, how can we go away from you? You have the words of eternal life. So, so can, I, can I just sort of unpack that? So we don't have a Scooby why you just said what you said. Yeah. It sounds weird. It sounds offensive. But we're detecting life. We know that you have li- You give us life. It's not death. It, although we don't understand, we're connecting to life, so we're staying. That's actually a good place to be. If you don't get it, but you do get it. You're connecting to life is a really good place to be. And often as, as, as individuals and as, as churches and as Christians, we've learned to connect to the reasons and not connect to the life. And what we're, the journey we're on is connecting to the life and God is explaining it to us as we go. So it's okay to not get it as long as you stay in there and as long as there's life coming out of you. Because the opposite is true. So uh, I started to realize that the truth in the mouth of the devil can kill you. So weird stuff in the mouth of Jesus can give you life, even like you kind of it's making a mess of your brain. You can't process it. It doesn't make sense. You don't have a grid for it, but it's life. Jesus is saying, do this stuff that we don't understand, but there's life in it, and we hang in there. But equally, stuff we do understand and sounds like the Bible and is the Bible in the mouth of the devil can actually kill you. So Jesus is being tempted uh, after his baptism by the devil, and he's been fasting 40 days and this is in Luke 4. You can find it. And, and the devil comes to him and tempts him and tempts him three times. And the first two times, he begins the temptation with, if you are the Son of God. So he's attacking his identity straight away. And the second time, he quotes a Bible verse. And, and from what I can tell, he quotes it really well. He quotes it from context. He quotes it it quotes it accurately. It is scripture. It's from Psalm 91. You can look it up. That he will, he will rescue you, capture you on, on like angels' wings. If you throw yourself off, Jesus, your heavenly father, your, your lovely heavenly daddy is going to rescue you. He's going to take you up on wings and rescue you. And what's the devil doing? He's taking a Bible verse accurately quoted and actually trying to kill Jesus with it. He's saying, Jump. Can you turn with me uh, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8? Now you're going to go there and you're going to go, this is strange. Do, to remember the first point I made, okay? Just stay, stay with me for the next 10 minutes. Give me some eye contact.
So 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and, and verse 4. Uh, have, you, have you found it on your device? Or? Here we go. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and, and there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we all live. We all live. Everybody lives because of him, not just the believers. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still accustomed to, uh, accustomed to idols that when they are so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificed or sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that, you, <coughs> that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, I just want to say that he's talking to the Christians and he's saying, food sacrificed to idols, doesn't matter if you eat it or not. Lots of us know that, but there are a few of you that have trouble with it because it's troubling your conscience because you believe still believe stuff about it, yeah? So there's all these believers. Some of them are very relaxed about this whole food sacrifice to idols things, and some of them, it's freaking them out if they eat the food. So their behavior is being governed by their conscience. Are, are, are you with me? So, they're, so they're, they're all going to heaven. They all love Jesus. Jesus loves them. But s- some of them are free in this thing, and some of them are not. And the thing that's inhibiting their activity and, and their behavior is their, is their conscience, is this inner sense of, of conviction of what is appropriate and what is right and what is wrong, okay? So, so the reality is it's okay to eat this stuff. It's not going to mess with you. That's the truth. But these people are yet to come into the freedom of that truth, and so their conscience has not been changed so they are uncomfortable with the freedom that the other people are living in. It makes them feel weird. So Paul's advice is actually the free guys in this situation just sort of calm it down for a bit till, if you like, the other guys catch up. But the, 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 the point I want us to see is what's in our conscience deep down, the sort of things we really believe rather than the things we say we believe, is what governs what we actually do. Yeah? And if what's buried in there is truth, then we'll live out of that. But if it's somehow distorted, if it's one of those devil quoted Bible verses, but it's built up a framework inside of us, then we're going to behave. Although we're in the truth, we're going to behave like it doesn't exist. And we could be uncomfortable with people who do. Am I making sense? And you could listen to someone like me say stuff to you, and every week you get uncomfortable because you're like, well, I could never be like that. Well, maybe it's because your conscience needs more renewed. Not because what's being proclaimed isn't truth. All right, so so there's, a, there's, a, there's an instinct that we have. If we're uncomfortable, we reject. I want to suggest to you that some things that make us uncomfortable, like, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood, we need to press into until we grow and we are no longer uncomfortable. So it's possible for something to be true, but that we don't have an understanding of it yet, so our conscience starts to reject it because our belief system isn't quite lined up with it yet. And I believe we're in a journey of getting out the junk, of getting out belief systems that have actually created a Christianity that is weaker and punier than it was ever meant to be. If I read the book of Acts, particularly the first few chapters, I'm like, wow, that's where I want to be. Yeah? Come on. 
If you read it, the fire falls, you know, 3,000 are saved. A little bit later, you know, this guy at the gate, beautiful, he's so healed. He's, he's been crippled for so long, but suddenly he's so healed that he's, he's leaping and dancing and praising God. A little bit later, Peter's walking along and they're dragging people out. And he, as he walks by, he doesn't pray for them. He doesn't do anything. His shadow falls on them and they all get healed. This is, this is normal Christianity and we're on a journey of restoring that reality. So I get excited when people get healed and I don't pray for them. Just, I just do. I'm like, that's one little step towards what he experienced and what he lived in. And, and, and I'm like, that's, but that's, that was the beginning point. We, it was, it, the intention of God is that isn't, the, the acts is not where we're headed. That was a beginning from which glory to glory continues onwards, rather than, oh, one day we'll be like Peter. No, actually, we're going to go beyond that because I think that was God's plan. I actually don't want to go back to the book of Acts because actually what happened is it all dwindled away. And what God's doing is restoring it all back. He's restoring the vigor and the capacity and the faith and, and, the, and the energy and the revelation of what it really means to be a Christian. What it really means to believe in God. What God is really like and who we really are and what that connection is like. And, and I just want to list some of, the, some of the things that he's sort of blowing up at the moment. That, that maybe live you know, around in our conscience somewhere. So we're going to do a little bit of demolition. So we can do some reconstruction. Because we, don't, we need our consciences to be reformed and transformed so that we can begin to live in line with what's really true, not just what we're comfortable with currently. And not what maybe the devil quoted us as a Bible verse. I mean, I can remember when I just became a new Christian. Isn't it funny? I had no church background. I'd been to a few weddings. I was christened, but I don't remember that. My parents weren't Christians. I, I become a Christian out of a, a non-Christian background. And somehow, somewhere in my head, I have some religious knowledge. I don't know where I gleaned it from watching television, going to a wedding. And suddenly, I'm like, because I'm now a Christian, I have to draw on something. I have to feel like I know something about this thing. And so they're telling me that I have to get baptized. So I'm like, okay, it's in the Bible. I have to get baptized. Uh, where are you going to get all the holy water from? Because they're all talking about baptism by full immersion. And I thought that it had to be from the River Jordan. So do you fly it in? <laughs> that was nuts, wasn't it? But that was the only, that I just had some fragment of religious ed education or knowledge that I, I was desperately trying to comprehend what was going on in my life. And I was building this crazy idea of some airline freighter with a big tank of water from the Jordan just to baptize me. I mean, like, this is, I'm like, this is, you don't need to go to all this expense just for me. Kind of craziness, but somewhere lodged in my con of my consciousness was some slightly crazy idea that was wrong. But it was a religious idea, and I was now religious, quote, so I just thought, maybe this is useful. Thankfully, I was, you know, I was educated in the higher ways, and they filled it from the tap. <laughs> and I suspect we all have that kind of, you know, Maybe not as nuts as that, but you know, we, stuff kind of clings around us because of what we saw on TV, how we've been raised, the culture that we're in, what somebody preached to us once even. I, I was thinking, what, what are these issues? Well, we've had 500 years of cessationism in the church. That is, people who don't believe that the miracles are for today, the gifts are for today. What's really fascinating is that that went on for 400 years, and then at the beginning of last century, there was the Pentecostal outpouring. 
the number of Pentecostals and Charismatics in the world in 100 years has exceeded the number, uh, number of, of Protestants in 400 years. So all the missionary activity and all the activity of the church after Luther, where they believed justification by faith, and all the energy and, the, and even the, um, the missionary movements that came out of all of that, as soon as the Holy Spirit was poured out, that movement has eclipsed in numbers, the other number, in 100 years, there's more than what took 400 years. Which gives you a bit of a clue. We need the Holy Ghost. But because of cessationism, if you look, there's hardly any material, theological material, about the Holy Spirit or about adoption for 400 years. It's all about election and a justification by faith. And that's got poured out and poured out. I'm not saying that stuff is wrong. It's just not the only thing. And it is wrong to believe that the miracles died out. And what we ended up with was a Christianity that believed all the great stuff happened at the beginning and what's left of the great stuff is going to happen at the end and we're in the middle with nothing much happening except waiting to be rescued. And it was illegal to believe for miracles, resurrections, healings, the dead being raised, victory, triumph, demons cast out, speaking in tongues, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. All that was illegal. That fun stuff happened at the beginning and then the other amazing stuff is going to happen to the end and we're stuck in the middle. And that permeated Christian thinking for centuries. And we're still escaping it. So what it created was a normal which was non-supernatural. And it's still out there. So what we're trying to do is change the normal. Say, so, well, you know, the normal that I experienced is it, but the normal wasn't the normal. We're having to change the normal because God is revealing and showing us again what his original intention was. That he's a father, not a judge, not just a judge. That there's a trinity involved. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he's not the butler. The one who wrote the book interprets the book. He's the best explanation of what is inspired in Scripture. You need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to know who He is in order to read the Bible and make sense of it. If you're struggling with the Bible, maybe it's because you just need more Holy Spirit. Not a better concordance or commentary, although those things are really helpful and, and I use them. So we ended up with a Christianity where sickness was from God and people who prayed for the sick were suspicious. So bad things came from heaven and people who were trying to do good things were probably demonized. That has happened. That is out there. We're changing it. God heals people. The devil makes people sick. I'm just... We, end, we had 1,500 years of where only special people got used by God. Yeah. Special people were saints. Yeah. And that's still in our kind of thinking is, well, you must be really special if God's going to use you really powerfully. That's just such a lie. Yeah. But it still kind of gets in there. And it, it was a bit like me thinking out to have holy water. We just kind of think, well, somehow, you know, he's at the front. He must be more special than me. That's just not true. I did all the good things in the future. We're afraid of being proud. It's like Calvinism 101 in the west of Scotland is don't get bigger than your boots. Don't stick your head up too high. Don't think of yourself too much. We actually think to be religious, this is what's got passed on to it, to be religious is for us to get really, really small so that God can be so really, really big. And if we think big things about ourselves or optimistic things about ourselves or powerful things about ourselves, we're in danger of coming into the sin of pride and being smitten from the earth by the Lord. 
I'm just saying, that's in there. That kind of, you know, some version of this is humility is in the sort of religious thinking. We live in a world that believes that science will have the answers without God's help. That thinks history is the history of humanity, not the history of the Son of God. You know, human history is the history of humans. Human history is the history of Jesus. He was the beginning because he created it all. He's in the middle because he came in his incarnation. And he's at the end because he's going to wrap it all up. History is framed and shaped, started, began, sustained by Jesus. Just saying. Religion is private and has nothing to do with other people, particularly politics, economics, arts, etc. That's not true. This is God's planet. He made it and his stuff works in it. And everybody actually needs and wants to know Jesus. Well, I, I, live my, I live my faith quietly. Is that because you believe this? Because this is a lie. There's always distance between me and God. I think we're going to have a referendum on this one. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. There isn't today because I'm in church, but there will be tomorrow because it's Monday morning. I feel he's close, I feel he's far away. Are you a yes or you are better together? Source of religion is distance. You have to do something to get closer. When Jesus came to reconcile man to God, he did that permanently. It's not about our feelings, it's not about what we were taught, it's true. You and God are now one. I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. Everything else is a lie to try and get you to get, do something to get what you already have. Do you remember in the, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, what were they made? Whose image were they made in? They were made in the image of God. They carried the image of God. What does the devil say to them? If you eat this fruit from this tree, you will be made to be like So he was saying, if you do something, you'll become who you already are. And so he introduced religion to the world. It's completely based on a devil lie. You have to do something to be better, get closer. And actually, the more you do it, the more you lose what you have. Because they actually bought the lie and lost what they had. I mean, it's still in the image of God, but something got corrupted in that process. So when these things get so ingrained in us that then when the truth comes along, we still feel uncomfortable because our conscience has been programmed by these, these lies. And God is reprogramming in us with the truth. And one of the things you really need, and I really need, for this to happen is experiences with the Holy Spirit. It can't happen without experiences.
Not, I know there is a Holy Spirit, but you need to meet Him. He needs to work in your life. Why, why am I saying this? Well, if you read Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14, he says he kneels, he kneels down before the Father from whom all fatherhood or all family finds its origin or finds its name. And, that, and that's why the church needs to rediscover fathering and the father because the, the lack of it in the world is killing the world. The person who, from whom it all originates is the father. Yeah. And the more you get disconnected from the father, the more you lose your image of fathering and family. So that's one of the things God's doing with us is reconnecting us to father and family for the sake of the world as well as for our own good. Just nod and say yes. That was a really good point. <laughs> and he goes on to say that he's kneeling before this father and he's praying that they would, they would have a, a working of power. Just say the word power. power. All these believers in this church and probably other churches, it was probably a round robin letter uh, to, to Asia actually, but it was addressed initially to Ephesus. All these believers, he's praying that there would be a work of... Say the word, please. Power. Can you say it more powerfully? Power. Because that is the word. It's rooted in the Greek word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. So he's praying that they would have a dynamite experience. Just saying. And we kind of rubbed some of that out of church as well, didn't we? Oh, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Now Paul's praying you'd have some dynamite. In order that your inner life can be strengthened enough, this is, this is strange, that your inner life, your inner man could be strengthened so that Jesus could live inside you and that you could know the full extent, the height, depth and breadth of his love and be filled to all the fullness of God. That's like Church 101 from the Apostle Paul. You need to experience, say the word, power. it's better, in order for Jesus to live. It's, it's like without power, your inner construction isn't ready to receive fully this incredible thing, which is the fullness of God. And we don't think we need power to know love, do we? They kind of they they are at conflict in our thinking, but I think one of the journeys God's had us on is we keep having power encounters, then we find out how loving He is. Yeah. Something gets strengthened on the inside, and we kind of realise more who we are and how full of Him we can be. Yeah. He's shifting our worldview. He's shifting our thinking. Okay, let's go for some let's go for some truth here. He's with me, he's not with me. Remember that one? Remember Adam and Eve? You all know about Adam and Eve. It says that they walk with God in the cool of the day. It says that they were naked and not ashamed. So that God came looking for them, calling out Adam, which is after they ate the fruit. So in the beginning, God's relationship with humanity was close, was intimate, was without distance, was without shame, was without fear, and it was out. Uh, they were not ashamed. They were not embarrassed. They were not focused on them. In Christ, we have been reconciled to God and we have been raised with Him by His power to be seated with Him in heavenly places. I want to propose to you that 
we have been reintroduced to that same intimacy without shame, without separation, without guilt, condemnation, or fear, to walk in the intimacy in the breeze of heaven. It's interesting, you go right back to the Hebrew word where it says the cool of the day. The word there is ruach, which is breath, which elsewhere is translated spirit. They were walking in the spirit of God with the Father God. And we've been reconciled to God to walk not now in a garden on the earth, but in heavenly places. Without fear, without shame, without separation, because we've been reconciled by his blood shed on a cross. For us, the recon- all the work is done. If you add any work to it, suddenly you've taken away from the grace and the gift. If you say, I have to repay, I have to repay, How, I, I don't deserve it, so I need to repay. You've made it not a gift, you've made it, you've made it something that you, you earn. It would be silly if you gave your kids gifts at Christmas and then said, by the way, here's the bill, pay me back by next year. But he's given me so much, I should, I should, just, I should just repay him. No, it was a gift. It's called the gift of righteousness. The gift of God is eternal life. Righteousness is a free gift. Gift. It's like every day is Christmas with Heavenly Dad. Just take it, take it, take it, take it. I already paid for it, and I don't expect you to pay me back. Remember the prodigal son? Goes away from the father, takes half the inheritance, goes away, squanders it, gets rid of it, spoils his life, spends half the family's money. He comes back to the father who is a picture of God. The father runs and embraces him, puts a robe around him, puts a thing, puts a the ring on his finger, restores his identity as a son, embraces him, kisses him, and he puts sandals on his feet. And I was always puzzled by the sandals. And then I read the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, you see that, 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 that uh, Naomi is selling her field. And that would mean that whoever bought the field would have, to marry, uh, would have to marry Ruth. And in the gate with the elders, there's Boaz, the, re- the redeemer. And there's one other person who has the right to buy this field. And he says, by the way, a certain person here, uh, this field could be yours. Would you like it? And he says, well, yes, please. I'd love to buy that field. He says, by the way, if you buy the field, you have to marry the woman. He says, oh, yes, I have other things to do today. So do we have a deal then? Because I'm willing to, I'm next in line to buy the field. Can we buy the field today? Can I buy it? Because I'm happy to marry the woman. He says, yeah, that's fine. So he throws his sandal at him. And it says that is the custom for showing that the deal was done in the gate. That was, that was their, it was like they're shaking hands. So here's the prodigal. He's getting all restored, all renewed, and Goodness gracious me, the father gives him sandals. <laughs> it puts a whole new spin on it. He can transact for the family. The wastrel can now transact. He hasn't got to do a year's you know, improvement course on what you do with resources. He says, here's the sandals. You can go in the gate and make a deal. That's our daddy. He's got so much... You can waste it and he's still got more left than he had before he gave it to you. He's not thinking preservation. He's thinking generosity. He's thinking gift. He's thinking giving. He's thinking overflowing. He's thinking super. Paul ran out of normal Greek words, so he produced new ones like super abundance. So abundance is already abundance, right? Abundance is meant to say lots and lots and lots of more than you could ever need. But he's saying, but God's so, he's, he's super abundance. So there's no gap. There's no shame. There's no distance. There's nothing to repay. There's nothing to earn. There's nothing to reestablish. You're forgiven. You're connected. You're united. You're in. You're in heaven. It's all a free gift. And that is who you are. 
whether you feel it today or tomorrow or yesterday, that is who you are as a free gift by the act of Jesus Christ on a cross and His resurrection. He's given us union back with the Father to walk in the Spirit in the realms of heavenly places without fear of separation, without any sense of shame or nakedness. We can be utterly transparent before Him. We are thoroughly known by Him. And He still embraces us completely and utterly without rejection or fault finding. He knows your deepest inward being to the fullest extent and yet He embraces you without any question or any fault finding or any kind of rejection of any part or element of your being you are not a mystery to him there is no gap there is no distance there never will be a gap you're in who's the seeker he is I've got to seek God more, brother. Well, seeking God is good and it's in the Bible. But you have to remember that he's seeking us. Who is looking for the lost coin? Who is looking for the lost sheep? Who is looking for the lost son? Who is, who's running? Who's, who's running from the front porch of his house to go to the son who's been gone? Who's been looking? Who's looking? Who came to seek and save that which was lost? It's Jesus. It's the Father. I, I was praying one day and just got this vision of the throne. I was like, oh, the throne room, the throne room. And there was nobody on it. I was like, what happened? And he said, see, he's running. I'm, it's because I saw you and I'm running to you. <laughs> I'm kind of wandering my way in through the courts like, ooh, we're supposed to be here. And I'm like, where? There's the throne. But he's not on it. No, it's because he's coming to me. (laughs) Read you some more Bible. Well, that was lots of Bible, but I wasn't reading it. (laughs) Colossians 2, 9 and 10, the Amplified Bible says this. For in him, that's in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, continues to dwell in bodily form. Just pause that for a minute. So when Jesus came, he came in a flesh coat yes. like yours. Yes. He came in skin like yours. And inside that skin, that fully human skin, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the fullness of deity dwelt. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And he's still, what he's saying, it continues to dwell because there's still a man on the throne. He didn't sort of discard flesh. He transformed it when he raised from the dead. There's still a human being on the throne in which all the fullness of deity dwells. Just, Just saying. Because he continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression to the divine nature. This is Jesus. He gives complete expression to the divine nature. There is no editing taken, taken place in order for God to fit in man. Didn't cut some bits off around the edge so he'd fit in human skin. The fullness of deity dwell in him and dwells in him in bodily form. Happy with that? I don't understand it, but I'm really happy about it. Oh, the next bit's really interesting. And you, as in me and you, there's some yous in the room. You and you are in him. And the same dude in whom fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And you are in him. Pretty good. Yeah. 
made full and having come to fullness of life in Christ, you too. Just, just hold tight to something. Honestly, to the chair or somebody that isn't going to complain. I've been waiting to say this for ages. Here it comes. This is the Bible, okay? The Bible. You, you, we establish you. You too are filled with the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are you holding tight? Because this is real. Do you want me to rewind to the beginning? So Jesus, a man in flesh, the fullness of God, no editing, no deletion, no shrinking, no kind of distortion. He's fully present, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in a man. He does his thing and goes to heaven. And he calls all of us, yous, and you crazy people believed in him. He says, right. Same thing happened to him is happened to you. Yeah. Oh, how could it possibly happen to me? I'm just human. He was just human. Yeah. He was only human, but also God, because the fullness of deity dwelt. So it's saying, he, can I, shall I read this again? Because I don't think you were holding on tight enough. You're in him. In Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, it must be different for me. No. no! Jesus was special. Yes, he was. Well, it was, it was. He was, but not as special as you're making it. He was special so that you could be special. Not he was special so you could go, wow, you're so special, Jesus, and we sing songs forever. Wow, you're so special, Jesus. You're also amazing. There's no one like you, and we're nowhere close to you. No, he's like, you're like me now. Do you want me to do that again? It's sinking in. I can feel it. I can feel it sinking in. Just hold a bit tighter. All right. Jesus, a man, a woman, a flesh body. He wasn't a woman, but he was a man. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, ladies, you're in, okay? <laughs> Father, all of the Father, all of the Son, all of the Holy Spirit in a flesh coat. And he walks around the planet. Not looking like me, like a zombie. He doesn't sort of go. You know, in all those movies, Jesus is sort of like gazing into the far distance. No, he's not like that. He's a human being, but he's giving off something awesome. He's leaking God to the planet. Because yeah. God's in him. The Spirit's in him without measure. So you want a drink? Come to me. He said. And then he says, do all the stuff, the cross, etc., etc., resurrection, enthronement. You guys believe in me? Patoom! 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Boy, my goodness. Still got that flesh body? Yep. Well, I had one of them and it still worked for me. You got all the Father, all the Son, all the Holy Spirit. You're joking. No, I'm not never joke about things like that. This is some serious stuff we're talking about. Uh, the fullness of deity dwelt in him in bodily form. And he now dwells in you. Connect the dots, anybody?
all the fullness of God was in him. Now he jumps inside of you. So what's inside of you? Come on, church. Say it. Dare to say it. All the fullness of God. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's right. Just say it. The fullness of God is in me. This is the Bible. This is in the Bible. My goodness, who hid it? <laughs> I'm staring at the Bible. And it says, God was in Christ. And in Christ is in me. Just in case we hadn't got the message a bit, it kind of moves us into it in Colossians because at the end of chapter 1 it says, Christ is in you. The hope of glory. That's your hope. It's the world's hope all inside you. My goodness. This could be exciting. You could have an identity revolution right this moment if you start to believe that God is in you. Because of what Christ did. And it works because he proved it worked because he walked around the planet with all of God inside of him doing, doing inner flesh skin without blowing it up. Like, surely if all of God was in me, I'd be a wreck, I'd be messed, I'd be toast. No, because Jesus wasn't. He's not toasting you, he's glorifying you. He's not ripping you to bits, he's making you a manifestation of his presence on the earth. We, we are indwelt with the fullness of deity. I said it. And then Paul, you know, Paul has, Paul's just, just a crazy guy. He says, okay, so he's in you. And then in another place he says, you've got you to, gotta, you gotta, so he's in you, okay? It changed your life to believe he's in you. It's not a feeling, it's just a fact. It will change the way we do church. It will change everything as we connect to the reality. Our consciences are wrestling with this right now because like, it doesn't feel like it's in me. This doesn't sound like what I was taught. Da, da, da. All those lies that have been there like built this conscience that says it's not right for me to say that deity lives inside of me. But it clearly says that we are partakers of the divine nature. Oh, that was Peter. So he had the same idea as Paul. Come on. This is what the Bible says. Not a little bit of the divine nature, not a shrunk down version, not a mediocre version, not an edited version, not a, not a wimpy, crappy version. The full, unedited thing that is God, who made the earth with a word, who sustains the planets and every single being is held together by Jesus and that Jesus lives in you. Then Paul says, uh, so he's in you, now you need to get dressed. And because he's in you, stop putting on the old clothes. So there's a way of life, there's a way of thinking, there's a way of behaving that the Bible talks about like an old life, it's like clothes. And we're supposed to take that off and put on the new clothes. Yeah, it's a good illustration. And and he kind of, he, 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 he kind of edges it a little bit in Ephesians where he says that this new thing we're putting on is made in the likeness of God. So that's pretty cool. He says it honest, chapter 4. Thank you. One minute. Oh, Jesus, help me. Romans 13, verse 1. He just nails it. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I've only got a minute, so I can't do this for too long. (laughs) Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are indwelled by God, the Almighty, the indivisible, the God only wise, the creator of the planets, the universe, in him who all things hold together is in you. And then you can put him on. Just putting on Jesus. It's like it says the, the language is like easing yourself into a good coat. So like, D- 
This isn't put on the behavior of Jesus. This isn't put on... This is put on the person of Jesus. This is not being indwelt with the principles of God. This is indwelt by God. The person. And you know what's even more... Like, I'm going to land with this. I'm going to fry your brain one more time. The Jesus that lives in us is not the Jesus that walked the planet that we read about in the Gospels. Is there another Jesus? Well, no, there's only one Jesus. But the one who's in us is the resurrected one. The one we're putting on is the resurrected one. We're not, we're not putting on an historic Jesus. We're putting on Jesus. We're not lived in by a historic Jesus. We're lived in by Jesus. That's why, and this I'll close with, Jesus said, you can do the works I do if you believe in me. That's why it works, because we are him to the world. And then he said, and you'll do greater works because I go to the Father. That's why. The one that went to the Father lives in us, so the exalted Christ is in us, therefore we can do more than he did. You better get your kids. Let's stand. So how are you doing? Religion has taught us that we need to stay small. Religion has taught us that we need to keep a healthy distance. Those are those truths in the mouth of the devil that has been killing the church for centuries. The cross did away with distance and made it possible for God not just to dwell with man, but dwell in man. I can tell by the looks on your faces that you're like, this can't be true. It is true. Study your Bible. It is true. Get our consciences changed because as we line up with this reality, then people are going to start getting healed that you don't pray for. Because he's in you. Stuff is going to break out around you that you never thought was possible because you line up with who you really are, not with what history, religion, or upbringing has told you you are. Stuff is going to happen around you because you start to line up with who he says you are, who he's made you to be, not what history, religion, or upbringing has told you you are. He's demolishing the lies so that we can live in the truth. And that momentum will return to the church like it's never been seen before. We won't have flash in the pan revivals. We'll have momentum. We'll go from glory to glory to glory. So if you just want to join with me in in praying, really, maybe just declaring some things, you can put your hand on your heart or lift your hands, whatever you want to do. Heavenly Father, thank you that you live in me, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just say it out. Thank you, you live in me, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unedited, undiminished, you live in me. Thank you, I can put on the person of Jesus. Not a historic Jesus, but the resurrected Jesus, the glorified Jesus, the victorious Jesus, the healing Jesus the holy Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, you live in me in all those ways. 
and I choose to clothe myself with you. I'm going to be different from today on. Because I realize who I really am. I've found out the secret. I've done away with the lies. I actually believe that you think I'm awesome. I actually believe I am awesome. Because you live in me. Amen. Amen. <laughs>